guys. <laughs> uh, I'm super excited to introduce our next speaker today, Evgone Moroso. He's coming all the way from Belarus. Um, I guess uh, most of you uh, know him from before, but um, if some of you don't, um, more so he's kind of a superstar at uh, our office, or not only <laughs> at our office. The only office, not <laughs> <laughs> um, Last year, he was named uh, one of the 28 most um, influential Europeans by Politico, which is impressive, uh, for his writing and research on political and social implications of technology. He has done an impressive uh, piece of work on exploring the impact of internet on nations, states, and also on the democracy. His writing has appeared in various newspapers, uh, such as the New York Times and The Economist, um, in addition to being a regular writer for The Guardian. That's, of course, not all he's done. Uh, he's written two books about the digital economy and thus shaped the discourse of, on this subject. Morso believes that technology should be debated alongside debates about politics, uh, economy, history, and culture. We couldn't agree more. Give a warm applause to you, Marcel. Can you just ask for some water? Because yeah. I will need it since 76. Um, all right, can you hear me with the mic? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back. This Today I did not come all the way from Belarus, I just came from Helsinki, so it was a <laughs> faster trip, but nonetheless I came with a cold, so uh, usually people, I guess, leave Norway with a cold, I came already, so uh, <coughs> you'll probably hear it in my voice as I move on. So uh, I was told I have an hour, and I would really like not to monopolize uh, all that time, since we will also be attacking monopolies, uh, so I will just use maybe half of it, or 35 minutes or so, and then hopefully we'll have a uh, discussion more than happy to also hear what you have to say and uh, respond to it where I can. Um, so I think I'll focus on three uh, themes, um, and I'll try to sort of pigeonhole all my remarks uh, within those three, and uh, we'll see if, uh, if I succeed. So uh, those three have to do with the overall structural transformation of this big tech giants that we all like to hate. I mean, I would argue that they're not monolithic, that there is actually quite a bit of uncertainty in uh, the services they provide and the sustainability of those services, and that there are certain quite predictable and rational uh, pressures that capitalist competition exerts on them that uh, shapes uh, the relationship with the users, but also with governments and each other. So the, the first part of the three, I would really like to highlight some of the transformations within the tech sector that I think are very important from a democratic uh, viewpoint, uh, especially. Secondly, I will talk a little bit about the relationship between big tech and finance and the ways in which uh, much of the growth and activity of this big tech sector is ultimately and intricately connected uh, with uh, not just financial markets, but also with the rather uncertain state in which global and highly financialized capitalism uh, is uh, at the moment, which also accounts for uh, the way in which massive pools of money um, are attracted to big tech and small tech, and that then shapes uh, also much of the local dynamics, right? So, you know, the, the reason, and I'll get into that as I move on, but just to highlight it at the very beginning, you know, the reason why uh, you see Uber or Lyft or any of these companies so much in the news uh, all over the world, essentially, is that they have managed to attract billions and billions in funding, uh, and this funding is used to essentially uh, drive out all their competitors out of uh, the game and then become the only providers of transportation services. But the reason why uh, that can happen is because they have pockets that are deeper than their competitors. So in here you really should start asking questions as to how come a company like Uber succeeds in losing, as they've done in 2017, $4.5 billion a year. Right, so it's not a for profit make it's not a profit making company, it's a loss making company. And then the question you should be asking is where does a company like Uber get the capacity to loss four or five billion dollars a year and still stay in business continuously? So I will try to answer uh, 
uh, that question and give you a solution to that puzzle. And finally, I think it would be very useful for us to conclude by looking at some of the geopolitical uh, themes uh, in, in this big tech debate, because as you have seen this year, and in the last few months of the last year, there is a growing competition of some kind between China and the United States, which has also finally led Europe to articulate some kind of a response, right? And I would argue that that response is not particularly strong or interesting or enough. But nonetheless, much what I would argue we are going to see with regards to big tech in the European context will be shaped not just by internal dynamics of the tech industry or the amount of money that financial markets can dump into it, but also by these geopolitical considerations, which uh, you know you see also affecting trade, many other domains. They would also affect and are affecting the development of technology. And so the battles we're now seeing between uh, the U.S. government and Huawei, you know, the, the Chinese firm, they are just a reflection of that. But I would argue that uh, we will see much more to come, especially as the battle for electric cars and artificial intelligence heats up and we are kind of moving beyond just focusing on 5G, as has been the case in the last 12 months. But I'll get to that as well. So let me go to the first theme, uh, which is uh, the internal dynamics of the, of the tech industry. You know, I think it's very common uh, for us to think that these companies are monopolies, they have very comfortable positions in their respective markets. You know, we tend to think that Google is relatively secure when it comes to internet search. Facebook is relatively secure when it comes to social networking. You know, and this analysis of them as monopolies very often gives us uh, a false sense of security because many of us think that their business models are set in stone and that essentially uh, they are impossible to disrupt. Uh, I think this analysis is partially true. Uh, partially it conceals that uh, most of the money that these companies make and most of the profits that they make, it does not come, strictly speaking, from their dominance in search or the dominance in social networking. It comes either from their uh, sales of advertising services or it comes from their sale of cloud computing services. Right? And when you look at uh, their market share in online advertising or in advertising as such, the numbers are not as uh, powerful as they are in internet search. So there is quite a bit of competition between Amazon and Facebook and Google when it comes to uh, online advertising. Uh, when it comes to cloud computing, there is almost uh, an open field with Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, and a few other firms, many of them Chinese, like Alibaba, fighting it with each other for the dominance in the cloud computing sector. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is that those two fields, including artificial intelligence, which you can lump under web services, are the fields where these companies actually make money. You know, the fact that Google allows you to search something online, or the fact that Google allows you to use Gmail, or you know, or Google Scholar, or Google Maps, or any of those services, uh, it does not really matter in the grand scheme of things because what matters is Google's ability to sell advertising better than Facebook. Right? And the reason why I would like to emphasize this point is that um, it's not at all a given that uh, their ability to sell, how should I put it, the ability to make as much money as they used to from either selling advertising services or cloud computing services or artificial intelligence services, that capacity I do not take for granted. In part because uh, there are new entrants coming from China, which can offer many of those services much cheaper. Uh, there are also uh, different profitability rates within those services. So it used to be that Amazon could make quite a lot of money and profits from selling goods, which is how they originally started. Now if you look at where they actually make virtually all their profits, it's from selling cloud computing services. So if you look at the actual profits of Amazon, which you know last year was something like $11 billion, virtually all of those profits come not from selling physical goods and products, it come from selling cloud computing or artificial intelligence services. Right? Which means that uh, having built that infrastructure, um, for me it's not at all a given that Amazon will stay in the retail business forever. They might, and so far they have a lot of sun costs there. But if tomorrow Amazon were to reinvent itself as a provider of cloud computing or artificial intelligence services, if you look at pure profit rates, they would probably become a far more profitable company almost overnight. 
Um, the reason why I'm saying it is that I do not take it for granted at all that the current model of Google and, and Facebook, which favors the provision of free services to consumers and users, while uh, advertisers manage to sell advertising and buy advertising using Google systems, which is what accounts for much of Google's uh, revenue and profits, I do not think that that profit is set in stone, nor do I think that it will stay there forever. Meaning that the benefits that so far have been touted as the benefits of the digital economy, which is the provision of free services. You know, you use Google for free, why? Because somebody, in this case the advertiser, is paying for it. I do not take that as a background condition that will stay there forever. And I can very easily imagine a scenario where Google, Facebook, Amazon, not because they decided out of their kind of sheer creativity, but because capitalist competition exerts pressure on them, suddenly decide to either suddenly or slowly abandon the provision of consumer-facing services. Because ultimately there is so much more money for them to be made in providing cloud computing services to the CIA or providing artificial intelligence services to other corporations. Right? And I think uh, for the purposes of kind of activist organizations, all that means is that the uh, infrastructure that we have taken for granted, which is you know, infrastructure like YouTube or Gmail or Google Search, I do not actually think that it runs on a sustainable model. Right? And I think it's time to perhaps start making those points in the public debate because ultimately we are at the whim of capitalist competition. And if suddenly Google decides that there is just far more money to be made in artificial intelligence, or in providing mobility services through the self-driving cars, or in providing image classification services to the Pentagon, or anything of that sort, they will actually start quickly exiting consumer-facing operations. Right? Um, so this is just to keep in mind, because you know, we tend to minimize the uncertainty that this ability and necessity and almost imperative to compete imposes on these firms. Right? And I think uh, it's very important to understand that that imperative is still there. And despite them being monopoly-like firms, they still have to compete for cloud computing, AI, and other services with Chinese firms and with each other. Right? So uh, I think this is a very important aspect to understand. And that brings us to um, a very interesting view of periodizing, essentially, the history of the internet, where we can say that up until roughly 2015, 2016, the internet was primarily driven by the needs of consumers, and advertising was essentially what paid for and shaped its development, while uh, in the last three or four years, the center of gravity in the development of the internet has shifted somewhere else. And it has shifted towards governments, uh, big firms, corporations, public sector, essentially becoming the clients that shape the development of digital economy and digital services, right? Which means that uh, if you really want to understand where the future of the internet and the digital economy is headed, you really have to be looking at what kind of services outside of the consumer bubble, outside of what we use as individuals, are actually being demanded and not being built. Because the money that Amazon and Google and Facebook spent on R&D, which on average is more than 12, 13 billion a year, I mean, they all spend tons of money on R&D. You know, it's not as if they have established a comfortable monopolies and they're just there milking uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the whoever pays for their services. They are actually investing quite heavily in R&D. But most of that spending goes precisely towards artificial intelligence and cloud computing. Right? And I think uh, that's one key dynamic that we should not lose uh, sight of. Um, as I've said, uh, the fact that China is perhaps the only country that has managed to build competition to the US in this field, uh, it's going to be of quite significance, not just for geopolitical reasons, which I will discuss later on, but also for purely commercial reasons, because they managed to offer many of the services much cheaper, and uh, essentially it will take uh, quite a lot of intervention uh, at the geopolitical level to keep Chinese providers of services like Alibaba or uh, Baidu or others uh, from providing, uh, for example, storage, uh, AI, and cloud computing services even to the public sector in Europe. So the fastest provider of cloud computing services in Europe is actually Alibaba. It's not 
Amazon, and it's not Microsoft, and it's not SAP. Right? And uh, I think it's uh, something that tends to get forgotten when we just keep our perspective limited to the ways in which consumers are being manipulated online by these digital giants. Because the amount of money that the public sector spends on cloud computing and AI, uh, it far um, exceeds uh, whatever it is that we spend as consumers. Right? And companies have understood it a long time ago, and it's now part of their business model to grab as much of that spending as possible. Which is why you know, they are constantly now pitching solutions to the uh, education ministries, healthcare ministries, uh, to you know, public authorities, task is transportation. Uh, they're very present at the city level. Uh, they're actually you know, pitching it as uh, smart city solutions of some kind. The idea is that now that we have managed to build this giant infrastructural systems for cloud computing and AI, uh, we will be able to monetize them by selling our services to the public sector and where possible actually by replacing it, in, 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 in the, at least in the form in which it existed before. And I would say that this element of expansion of the firms into the public sector, which again is driven, as I've said, mostly by the internal dynamics of competition in the big tech sector, it's something that we need to spend much more time on. And that you know the dangers that come from these firms, they are not primarily related to fake news or manipulation of public opinion or uh, intervention in elections. They are as much shaped by their desire to grab as much of responsibility for essentially running essential infrastructure that relates to provision of welfare services uh, and you know, transportation services and many others. Right. So uh, that I think also should alert us that in the absence of a robust alternative infrastructure that might come from the state or it might come from somewhere else, but ideally should come from the state, uh, there, are, there is no alternative but to use Amazon or but to use Microsoft or to use Google. Because ultimately, as you embark on this mission of digitization of the public sector, your options are relatively limited and you do not have uh, no commercial solutions which you can just plug into and say, okay, if I would like to analyze all traffic flow in my city, I can actually build my own platform or I can just, you know, go and hope for a non-commercial solution that just doesn't exist, right? And the fact that they do not exist also highlights this massive gap in uh, absence of strategic thinking uh, around things like artificial intelligence and cloud computing. Right? And this is where it's uh, very worthwhile to explore to what extent something like artificial intelligence uh, should count as a critically important piece of infrastructure that uh, should not be uh, held exclusively in private hands of you know, foreign corporations. In which case, um, your strategy will be completely different. You will need to have an industrial strategy of some kind for the development of artificial intelligence. Uh, you might need to uh, delegate that mission to your local domestic firms, if you have them, and if not, you need to cultivate them. And that's more or less the debate that now shapes a lot of political discussions, even in mainstream political circles in France and Germany, where uh, both countries have discovered that you know much of their uh, even secret service uh, and kind of surveillance apparatus is in the hands of American firms like Palantir. So the French have discovered that, which has suddenly uh, made uh, the subject of technological sovereignty uh, a big theme, uh, even for a relatively you know, neoliberal president like Macron. You know? So he has no problem talking about technological sovereignty for France and, and Europe, because uh, they have realized that essentially if the current pace of outsourcing of critical technological infrastructure continues at its current pace, uh, France will just be dominated by the American and Chinese firms, and which will then might result in industrial espionage and many other things. But the counter strategy towards that is figuring out what sort of alternative solutions, platforms, players you need to cultivate locally, which of course is a task that uh, European governments have by and large forgotten how to do after you know, 30 or 40 years of uh, neoliberal policy. But um, let me talk a little bit about finance, you know, the second part. So you know, the dynamics of the big tech and the shift from consumer internet to public sector and kind of big 
client-facing internet. I think something that is relatively clear, but the role of finance in all of this is uh, not quite obvious, uh, in part because we tend to focus on uh, catchy companies, which are always in the news, like Facebook or Amazon, and we tend to uh, ignore the money that is behind that. So if you look at, for example, something like mobility uh, services, so if you look at Uber and their closest competitor in the world called uh, Lyft, right? So uh, Uber, as I mentioned, is a company that loses billions of dollars a year, right? And the reason why it can afford to lose them is in part because they have very deep pocketed investors behind them. The main investor there, of course, is this Japanese uh, entity called SoftBank, which is not really a bank, it's a telecommunications firm which runs one of Japan's largest uh, phone networks. Uh, but in addition, they managed to take very good advantage of the low interest rate environment in Japan and the financial crisis, and they have raised quite a lot of debt. So uh, SoftBank uh, is more than $150 billion in debt, uh, and they do not worry much about it. And they have used this ability to borrow very cheaply to essentially create a couple of funds which they invest in technology uh, and which they invest in companies like Uber. So in the case of SoftBank, they've created the largest technology fund called Vision Fund, where they've put some of their own money, I think around $25 billion of their own money, but they've also raised money from the likes of the government of Saudi Arabia, which put $45 billion of their money the Sovereign Wealth Fund of uh, the Emirates, uh, Goldman Sachs, Daimler, you know, the German car company, and a couple of others. And essentially, it's a company, it's a fund with 100 billion spare capital, which dwarfs most of the large American, but also European venture capital firms put together. And when you have a fund of that size, uh, you can actually play very big. And you can not only make very big bets, you can ensure that the valuations of all the other companies go up because there is just so much money chasing relatively few startups. So the reason why Uber now is preparing for an IPO, which will value the company at more than $100 billion, is in part because SoftBank has ensured that uh, there is just so much money being put into Uber at valuations that are so high that everybody comes to believe in the fact that Uber is in fact valued so much because there are investors willing to dump money into it. But the only reason why there are investors willing to dump money into it is in part because there are investors with too much money to dump and they have nowhere else to dump them. So it's a vicious circle of some kind, which you could otherwise describe as a tech bubble, which I think it's not, it's not a myth that you know, we are living through times when uh, a couple of players with, who already have very large stakes in uh, rather dubious companies like Uber, they are interested in keeping those valuations where they are and perhaps even growing them because that's the only way for them not to lose their existing in, uh, investments. So you have this vicious circle where SoftBank now is incentivized to build a second fund of an even larger size and go raise even more money from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries so that you know it can then go and pour even more money into Uber and thus drive its valuation even higher and bring it to an IPO where hopefully they will cash out and get their money back. Uh, yes? What is IPO? IPO, it's an initial public offering and it's basically when a company goes public on the stock exchange. So when you uh, no longer are treated as a private company with just private investors, you go to the stock market, you list your shares, and you sell your shares to the public. So uh, imagine in the case of Uber, when Uber goes public, when it does its IPO, which is planned for this year, uh, it will be valued at some amount of money. So the investors will decide what its shares are worth. And right now, it looks like it will be valued at more than $100 billion, right? Which uh, you might think is a crazy amount for a firm that loses $5 billion a year, right? It's not a company that's making profits. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's valued uh, so highly in part because the expectation that its ability to lose so much money uh, is there because, first of all, it has very powerful people and companies believing that it will eventually succeed 
But success in the case of Uber means that it will essentially destroy all of its local competitors, be the only provider of mobility services, and then it will somehow make up for the money it loses now with tremendous profits five or 10 years down the road. And those profits might come from its ability to keep its costs down because it will essentially uh, switch to fully automated cars so it will not have any drivers. And once you have the, no drivers, you have no labor expenses. Or you would be able just to raise the tariffs and raise the prices up so you will actually, and nobody will be able to counter that because all the competition will be destroyed by that. Right? So that's more or less the strategy of big capital that stands behind Uber, that they can now take advantage of the fact that they have so much more money than anybody else in order to make sure that competitors of Uber essentially get out of business because they cannot match the uh, low prices that it charges us. Right? So it's, it's not a very sophisticated strategy, but the reason why I brought it up is to show you that so Uber has this big pool of money behind it from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Goldman Sachs, and others. But its main competitor, Lyft, have the same pool of money coming from somewhere else. They, it comes from another Japanese billionaire called, uh, who is behind a company called Rakuten. So you essentially have these two Japanese billionaires with plenty of money to lose fighting each other. Uh, and it all happens at a global scale. And the hostages and the victims, so to say, are the rest of us who, while enjoying relatively low prices in Uber now as consumers, you know, we can leave the labor side of Uber aside for a second, we will discover that five years from now, there are only two possible uh, alternatives. It's either that uh, the prices will go up, in which case we'll start paying more for transportation if we allow Uber to come in and conquer uh, the cities, which has not happened everywhere, or uh, we will end up with essentially everything being automated uh, in the provision of its services to a point where uh, the prices will remain what they are right now or would even go lower, but all the profits made by Uber and all the money that used to stay in the local economy because local people that drove for taxes went out and bought cars and apartments and newspapers and whatnot, that money is no longer there, and the profits just flow from the local economy to investors behind Uber, which means that they flow from the local economy to Goldman Sachs, Saudi Arabia, SoftBank, and the others. Right? So I don't see how that story can end positively. But the reason why I was giving you this example is only to show that so much in what passes for technology, so to say, you know, Uber, you know, there is this myth of this company being very efficient, driven by algorithms, and so forth. The real story behind Uber has to do with finance much more than it has to do with technology. So Uber, as it currently exists, would not be possible without this ability of SoftBank to borrow very cheaply, to dump so much money into it, and without the uh, ability and willingness of players like Saudi Arabia to dump all this money that they have from oil into a company like Uber. Because Uber just would, would shut down without this channel of money coming in to keep it afloat, it would never be able to continue staying in business for as long as it has stayed. Right? And being able to retrace those steps uh, in its development to the world of finance and to the global economy, and not just leave the analysis at the level of algorithms, I think is a very important step to make in our understanding of the digital economy, because if we do not do that, we end up having a discussion about you know, transparency of its algorithms, the way in which it uh, might be controlling its drivers, which is a very important point, which I do not want to downplay. But it still disconnects us from grasping what the only possible future of an Uber-like service is. Right? Because ultimately, people who have been behind it and who have been losing $5 billion a year are not going to let it go and continue losing money indefinitely. <laughs> At some point, they would either want to get the money back or uh, do something else with it, right? So, and at this point, I think uh, the uh, it's quite obvious what they're going to do, and that something will be basically getting total domination of transportation markets in countries where they operate, uh, pitching more and more solutions to the public sector, so that they can actually uh, uh, not just offer taxes, but offer an entire panoply, if you will, an entire set of services. So it will be scooters, electric bikes,
whatever they can, they will be replacing, replacing buses and trams. And that's happening in Europe, by the way. It's not, I'm not inventing some kind of you know, dystopia happening in New Jersey. I mean, in, 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 if you go to France, there are parts of public transportation system in Nice, for example, that uh, at night, where it's very unprofitable for the city of Nice to operate night buses, they're already being offered by Uber. So you know, there are certain parts of the map, uh, transportation map of Nice, which are essential within the hours of two and six, are offered by Uber, with Uber getting paid by the French public sector and the city of Nice to provide those services. And I expect that as the budgets of many uh, cities uh, shrink, uh, you will get this pressure to outsource as much of this to well, Uber, but also Uber has competitors. Right? It has uh, uh, Google's company called Waymo doing that. Uh, you have now alliances uh, between uh, big transportation, big, within big car companies. So you know, Daimler and BMW has just joined forces this week to offer their own alternative to uh, to Uber, essentially, right? Which I think is a very important point to keep in mind that the developments of the digital economy and its connection to finance, it starts producing its secondary effects on existing players like Daimler and BMW, which then uh, have to adjust their own models. It's a very trivial and banal point to make, but I think we should not uh, underestimate the amount of turmoil and kind of structural adjustment, to use a term you use in another context, uh, that's happening in, in, in the rest of the economy as such, right? And uh, so the impact of this digital firms backed by big finance, uh, it's, it's not felt just in their only limited bubbles, it's also felt elsewhere as we get new set of alliances, you know, an alliance between BMW and Daimler would never come about normally because these companies compete quite heavily uh, with each other in uh, European, Asian, American, and other markets. And nonetheless, the pressure to have a solution uh, against the competition from uh, Uber, and Google, and Baidu, and uh, so Bank, and others, forces them to join forces, right? So this is just something to, to keep in mind. And uh, to pass from finance to the third point I wanted to highlight, which is the point related to geopolitics, I think it's important to understand that um, Americans have kind of slept through the rise of China when it comes to big tech. And uh, it's very hard to understand uh, how that happened. Uh, but I think uh, there is very little doubt that uh, Washington now is committed to make up for this decade they have lost in preventing the rise of Chinese uh, big companies. And not just their rise, but also their rapid expansion into markets that were previously dominated by American players. So you know the fact that you have Chinese uh, grab a large share of the uh, cloud computing market in Europe, for example, means that uh, Microsoft, uh, as well as Amazon, uh, stand out to lose quite a bit. So you should expect uh, Americans to start raising a lot of red flags about the reliability of Chinese uh, cloud computing services. You will see exactly what we have seen with 5G over the last 12 months, repeat with uh, cloud computing and artificial intelligence services. To me, it's quite obvious that um, there is a realization that the most advanced part of the American economy, which of course has to do with uh, digital stuff, you know, and you remove uh, Google and Microsoft and uh, Amazon and Facebook from uh, uh, American stock markets, and you will see that uh, there has been barely any recovery from the financial crisis. I mean, all of the growth in the American financial markets, essentially stock markets, has to do with the fact that these companies have been growing like crazy. I mean, there has been some uh, negative trends, partly having to do with scandals around Facebook, but ultimately the most dynamic part of the U.S. economy is that. You know, you can throw in Tesla maybe there as well, but ultimately uh, you, you, you remove this four or five big tech companies and the American economy is not doing particularly well. So uh, I expect that Washington will do whatever it can to slow down the rise of the Chinese firms, which uh, to be honest, uh, have uh, some structural advantages when it comes to the American ones, in, in part because they have far more data to build on, so they can build artificial intelligence services that are far more advanced, particularly when it comes to services like facial recognition, for example. 
they can just, because of close alliances between the tech uh, firms in China and the state, it's just much easier for them to draw on databases of millions and billions of faces and essentially train their systems to do things which uh, American firms currently have to pay for. So you know where Amazon might need to pay uh, through its Mechanical Turk service to freelancers all across the world to label a database of images so that they can actually recognize objects one from another, which is what accounts for 80% of what passes for artificial intelligence. You know, all this discussion we are having about artificial intelligence now, mostly it's the ability to recognize very basic things, it's the ability to recognize you know, cats from dogs on photos and people uh, from cars and you know, traffic lights from houses. I mean, that's what passes for 90% of progress in artificial intelligence uh, these days. But nonetheless, you can monetize that ability very well. And this is what Amazon has done, where they built Amazon Web Services, which was that cloud computing infrastructure I was describing at the beginning, which is fantastic for uh, companies that do have large data sets and they do need to be able to differentiate between you know, different voices, objects, text, sentences, languages, and so forth. So for this massive analytical tasks, these systems work, but they have a different cost structure. And the cost structure of Chinese firms because of the alliance with the state, because of lax privacy rules in China, and because of the way in which Chinese technology strategy is integrated with Chinese trade strategy, uh, the Chinese firms just manage to ma offer many of the services cheaper than the American ones, which means that when they come to Europe, they also offer those services to clients cheaper than the American ones do. And I mean, of course, you can raise all sorts of political red flags about uh, how they do it. I mean, the story which is discussed very often is the way in which the Zimbabwean government has let one of the big Chinese tech firms to get a database of uh, 200,000 photos of its citizens uh, in order to train uh, that system to recognize faces uh, you know, of people with darker skin color. Because previously, the Chinese just had no access to such data, and uh, then because of the intergovernmental contacts between the governments of China and Zimbabwe, you suddenly gain that capacity. So boom, now uh, all of a sudden, uh, the Chinese uh, tech firm has the ability to recognize essentially you know, uh, faces of people from Zimbabwe much better than uh, any other company in business because uh, Americans might not get that data as cheaply. So and that also highlights this importance, uh, which might not last forever, but nonetheless is still important now, the importance of uh, data and the ability to extract data at scale for the training of artificial intelligence services and uh, a couple of other digital services that these companies are now selling. Right? And the ease with which such data can be harvested, uh, it's, it's a factor not just of technological know-how, it's also a factor of uh, where these companies stand on the geopolitical scene and who backs them up. Right? And I think it's very important to understand that I think there are diminishing returns to data. So you know, whenever you see that data is the new oil, and you see it on the cover of The Economist and elsewhere, I mean, to some extent, it's correct. But there is also a, quite a lot that this rhetoric conceals. You know, and I, th th there are different ways in which data is valuable. Right? Data, when it comes to advertising, uh, you know, there is as much that Google or Facebook can learn about you. Uh, and after that, uh, the sort of the, the utility of extracting more data diminishes, right? And uh, it's, it's quite obvious that you know, most of us do not develop new interests overnight. And to understand 90% of our interests, it's enough to monitor us for a year. You do not monitor us for 100 years, right? And then, of course, you might need to continue monitoring us to make sure that our addiction to the service is still there. Because ultimately, unless we go back to Facebook and we use Facebook, uh, they lose a user, which badly reflects on the ability to uh, sell advertising, right? So they might need to know what it is that we do. So they might need to extract data, but not because that data allows them to personalize advertising better, but only because it allows them to perpetuate the addiction that we have to the service, right? Which is a very different rationale for our extraction. Uh, but the same logic applies to training artificial intelligence systems, which is the other rationale for extracting all this data. You know, on the one hand, you might say that the reason why Google or Facebook extracts data from us 
it's not only to sell advertising, it's also because we indirectly train their systems to recognize objects, to make predictions. So there is this other hidden use to data, right? Which I think ultimately, if you want to come up with a very heuristic, simple theory, which explains to you why these companies are valued as highly as they're valued now, it's that, that you know, the data that they collect in the process of selling advertising also has a secondary use for which they're not paying. And that secondary use is using that data to sell artificial intelligence services and everything else. But what I'm saying is that that data also has a limited shelf life. That ultimately, you know, there is as much as you can learn from the data that we are supplying to these firms about classifying objects, voices, words, text, and so forth. That, you know, I do not produce you know, I will teach Google how to recognize objects by, you know, selecting photos when they ask me to prove that I'm not a robot, you know, which probably happened to you. So I have to, like, choose bicycles that you see on photos of, you know, of the city. And those are bicycles or no bicycles, you do it. But there is a limit as to how much that system can be taught, right? And ultimately, you at some point hit a limit at which point you no longer become valuable to Google and Facebook and Amazon or whoever else uses that system, right? And that kind of brings me back to the first point where I started, that you know we tend to assume somehow that the economics of the digital economy, they, they, they're set in stone and they have a certain dynamic and that dynamic has a self-perpetuating logic to it. The other thing is the wrong assumption that you know ultimately there would arrive a moment where us, the, the users as you know containers of data, as you know bags of data, if you want to talk in a very kind of brutal way, uh, we would no longer be as useful as we were once, in which case uh, the interest in us also diminishes, right? Uh, and I'm saying it only because it's very important to understand that we are living through uh, a point in history where it is correct to say that there is this scramble for data as there used to be a scramble for oil, you know, a scramble for Africa, hundred or you know 120 years ago but that is not going to last forever that sooner or later you are going to essentially hit a wall where most of the progress in artificial intelligence will come from your ability to produce superior hardware the ability to have uh, superior chips inside your system the ability to I don't know integrate it with quantum computing and it will not just be around data so you know it's important, of course, to understand the role that data plays uh, in the digital economy now. But it's also very important to understand that there are limits, and we are soon going to hit those limits. At which point, much of the progress and much of the competition between the Americans, the Chinese, and to some extent the Europeans, it will be shaped by other factors. At which point, you really should start asking questions as to, well, do we have a supply of semiconductors that you know we then go to, or do we have a, have a supply of chips? Uh, that will allow us to have autonomous development of artificial intelligence, or would we eventually be dependent on chips coming from China, or from the United <coughs> States, or from somewhere else? And I think if we, in Europe, were really serious about uh, developing an autonomous strategy, uh, whereby you know we would highlight and kind of mark artificial intelligence and you know to some extent cloud computing but anything that is then connected to you know digitizing even the public sector as a strategic area then we really have to understand what components we need to have under control whether this control of the state or the public sector or of you know trade unions or some other uh, non-commercial actors but we need to understand what those components will be and some of that might be data but some of that might be having some kind of a semiconductor chip industry, or some of that might be something else. But without asking those questions, I think we will end up in a situation of dependency, right? And that dependency right now, it's kind of healthy in, in some sense because you have at least two providers, one in America and one in China, fighting with each other, and Europe can play them off each other. My expectation is that that balance might not be there forever and that you know the, the fight the geopolitical fight between China and America somebody is going to emerge victorious in it in which case um, you know, it's possible of course that all this 
talk that we now have about cold tech war mm -hmm. is not incorrect and that you will have these two poles and that essentially uh, America will be, or Europe will be able to play those two poles against each other, you know, the way, I don't know, Finland or maybe someone else used to do it during the Cold War. Um, but I doubt that that will be the case. And the next year or so will be the test for that. You know, to what extent the United States occupies uh, and still has enough political and economic power in Europe to completely dissuade it from relying on Chinese products and services. Right? And that's the very big test. And, um, and what the retaliation would be if uh, Europe does not comply and opts in for Chinese providers of AI or cloud computing or 5G? And I think that's a very big question and uh, European politicians have woken up to this question far too late. And in some countries they have not woken up to it altogether at all. Uh, in part because they do not see what the retaliation might be, but I can assure you that if big German enterprises start uh, having their cloud computing needs served by the Chinese firms, you will see uh, an immediate effect on uh, Volkswagen and BMW and Daimler and what they can do in America, in part because so many of their cars are assembled there, even if they're then shipped to China. Right, so uh, I think it's very important for us to keep sight of this geopolitical background to the uh, tech development because ultimately, if we were to think of counter strategies, you know, and I'm more than happy if we, if we, once we move into Q&A also to think about the role of other players. You know, there are clearly things that cities can do when it comes to articulating alternative regimes of data ownership, for example, right? So there are things which do not require kind of large scale European or national level intervention. There are smaller things that can be done, but I think without having a global view of uh, how much money and geopolitical power you would need to embark on some kind of a counter project, uh, many of these local interventions will be kind of futile, right? And if ultimately you are thinking that your local mobility service built in your city with your fantastic public servants doing fantastic code and you know and whatnot will be able to resist the uh, luring efforts of SoftBank with $100 billion uh, behind it, uh, I think you know ultimately it's, it's naive. So I mean, yes, of course, you'll be able to keep them out by law for some time. And you know, if you manage to change the discussion about these issues in the international trade bodies, maybe you'll be able to do it for longer than we expect. But without having uh, similar institutions with similar <laughs> amounts of funding, um, and with a very clever geopolitical strategy, I just think that very little of substance can be achieved. And then the question becomes, if currently all the money chasing AI startups, and even, you know, I'll give you an example, which will illustrate the problem we're in quite well. <laughs> so I'm somewhat involved with a large European project called Decode which is basically an effort to build an alternative data ownership regime and go beyond the idea of data as private property and to basically enable cities and other public actors to have robust, uh, decentralized, but nonetheless publicly controlled data pools, we can call it like that. And, you know, and the most sophisticated and this is a European project, so it has 12 partners you know, and so forth, and uh, one of the most sophisticated, robust parts of that project, based at the University College London in the UK, uh, which was basically a bunch of academics who were doing the most advanced work on um, decentralized data storage using blockchain, they were just bought out by Facebook. You know, it was a university department. Now it's a part of Facebook. So you know, whatever you were expecting to do with four million dollars of European Union money, uh, European Commission money to develop an alternative, now it's like it's that. So because all the people who can be working on these issues, uh, they cannot stay uh, on the market uh, forever because the amount of resources that they need to truly develop what they want to be developing, they would need not four million dollars but four hundred. And the only one who can offer them 400 at this point, without massive public investment coming into the field, are Facebook, Google, SoftBank, uh, Alibaba, and others. Right? Which I think, uh, and, you know, and it's not a question of lack of money. I mean, we can we have a lot of money sitting in different pools, and you know it in this country better than I do. But it's a matter of 
finding ways to use that money in a way that can allow us to have a robust strategy of some kind, whether you would call it industrial strategy or digital strategy or something else, I think is peripheral. But without doing that, we'll just end up with a lot of talk. But with all of the people who have a clear vision of what's to be done, essentially joining the enemy. And because there is no exit for this, even no matter how dedicated, noble, bright, and intelligent you are, if you're working in tech, even if you're working on the centralized solutions, if you're working on something that will eventually undermine these firms, you'll stay afloat two, three, four, five years. But it's obvious that the only exit strategy for you, given the current configuration of forces in the economy and in politics and society, is by joining this firm, joining this firm. Right? And unless we change that, which would require a massive type of change in, in how we think about technology, I think there is very little hope, uh, which you know, I'm still remain hopeful, because I think we can still transcend the limitations of thinking about technologies as algorithms, as something that's purely instrumental, as disconnected from finance or economy or trade. I mean, we can transcend all those limitations, but once we do, Without a clever political strategy of how we can mobilize money, you know, political support, as we can explain these issues to all of the relevant players, from trade unions to pensioners to pension funds to whoever, I just think that without that conversation, uh, we will not get very far. So uh, I'll leave you on this rather dark note in this sunny room, and uh, I'm more than happy to take questions if you still have. Well, sorry, I went on for 15 minutes. Instead of, sorry, but uh, so I did monopolize the conversation, but I'll still take your question. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, you, I guess I can see the answer to these questions in some parts of the talk, but I still want to ask it. Uh, two reasons for asking a question. First of all, to understand the competition between the tech firms, but also to understand how to develop public sector industries. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was um, I was thinking when you said that Facebook and Google could be not as stable as we think. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking about the books that I read about you know this topic written in 2008 or 2011. It's quite funny to see like. It talks about MySpace, it talks about you know, yeah. all these things that are very temporal. Uh, but uh, in order to develop uh, AI, you need uh, data. So this also means that you need, in order for new players to, to establish themselves, you need some kind of well or some kind of place to give where people are willing to give away their data. Uh, so you mentioned the, the example with Zimbabwe, but uh, where do these new players monitor citizens on a big scale? So up until now, you have addiction as a, a driving force to, to extract data. Addiction, uh, you said? Addiction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but I don't see how this shift will come uh, still, because uh, the way I understood it is that these firms are keeping, like, extracting their data in silos. So, Yes. You have Facebook and Google have an enormous amount of data now. Yes. And how uh, are these firms not uh, being like totally impossible to, to challenge? Sure. So, I mean, I didn't really get into the policy discussions now, but there are policy discussions in, in both in the US and in Europe that pertain mm -hmm. to what we should do about these big tech firms, right? One solution is to push them towards sharing some of their immense profits with the rest of us. And you know, in America, there is a very vibrant discussion about what they call a data dividend, which basically would mean that everybody would get something of a check at the end of the month, so at the end of the year, which reflects in one way or another the value that we have produced for these firms. Uh, this solution I find horrifying because ultimately it leaves everything as it is now, so these companies can keep on growing and they can even enter new sectors and domains from healthcare to transportation to education. And as consumers receiving a data dividend from them, we would even be happy <laughs> in theory because that means we'll get even more in, by way of a paycheck. Uh, but that logic is very flawed because if you follow carefully what I said, uh, you know, the logic in which these firms work is that they harvest some data from us, 
right? But then that data is not only used to sell advertising, but then it also feeds into their uh, government and business facing uh, services and businesses. And uh, once they talk about data dividend, there is no recognition that we generate value also for their much more profitable government and business serving uh, sites and not just for advertising. Because if you just take the number of users that Facebook has and you calculate what it is that we generate for Facebook without data, the number of days is, is minimum. It's not, you're not gonna get, uh, it's not gonna equal a basic income of some kind that you know you're gonna get and live off comfortably. You're gonna get a check of you know $10 a month or a year. It's relatively tiny. Because the assumption is that everything else that these firms do when it comes to AI <coughs> and cloud computing has nothing to do with their consumer-facing business, which, of course, is nonsense. So this is one side, which is one possibility of what it is you can do, which is basically reduce everything <coughs> to the question of economics, right? calculate the value, and give that value back to consumers. It's a very kind of neoliberal-friendly solution. Uh, the other solution is, of course, to break them up um, and to, in America, it's gaining force, this movement. You, so you will not only separate Facebook from WhatsApp and Instagram, but you will then also try to break up Facebook maybe into four or five social networks instead of just one. Uh, in the same, you know, you can, how you can separate Google Maps from Google, or you can separate, you know, there are many things which they have integrated, and you can break them apart. Um, that solution to me does not sound particularly good in part because uh, it just does not, you know, it, it, it just leaves everything also almost as it is. You know, it, it has no, it has nothing to say about an alternative conception of what a digital society should look like and what role, you know, data, AI, cloud computing should play in it, and how we can organize society differently. It essentially says, well, fine. Once you break up those firms, then market competition, one way or way, but one way or another will eventually tell us what the common good is and what uh, uh, will come out of it. So my proposal would be to do things uh, very different. It would be on the one hand to recognize that data that we generate, uh, we generate it not just individually, but also collectively and socially, which means that uh, you know to think about it as private property and to assign value to it and to establish the secondary market and data, it's just, it's a way to kill off any non-market approaches to building public services. Because ultimately, if you start assigning price to data that I produce as I walk down the street in Oslo, uh, if my uh, municipality would like to build a mobility service or planning service or urban planning service, using that data, they will have to pay for it, right? And it's not at all obvious that uh, that's an arrangement that uh, should be in place, right? So uh, I would rather try to figure out what our social and political arrangement for our ownership should be, how you can establish social and collective rights to data, how you can then make sure that uh, public actors and social actors like municipalities, but also eventually nation states, uh, can treat this data not just as uh, an input into production, which is how it's being treated now, but as infrastructure, about around which you can actually establish conditions of access and you can say that you know, if I am a local startup, or if I am a local NGO, or if I'm a local citizen association, I get to use the data produced by this neighborhood, not just for free, but might even get a government grant of some kind to use it. And if I'm Amazon, or SoftBank, or Uber, I'll have to pay for access to that data. And to me, it sounds very reasonable. You know, that way you actually favor the development of local grassroots efforts and initiatives and startups, which can do something with the data and that do it in an environment which they know best, while big players actually have to pay more. But it's it's a complete gestalt switch. It's a complete change of the paradigm, where instead of having this, uh, you know, instead of having us pay for services uh, that these companies offer us, we charge them for providing services to us. But that would not be enough, because uh, once you solve the data question, you would still need to have a strategy as to what it is you're going to do with artificial intelligence. And so you will need to have a strategy how are you going to use some of that data that is generated by us uh, to train uh, AI systems, which ideally should be in public hands, and which should be something as a public good that you know everybody can tap into.
and instead of paying based on usage, as is now the case with Amazon Cloud and Amazon Web Services, you would just be able to tap into it and use it for your own good, just like you do with infrastructure. You know? I mean, of course, you can establish a fair way to price it, like we price trains and transportation and health and other things occasionally, but the idea that it has to be done by three, four, five big companies, to me, is, uh, is something we have to question. So my question was how you expect data as a public, the public, how the public expect data. So I sure. understand your answer as uh, you nationalize the data extraction. Well, why, I mean, why would private companies want to extract data if they don't own it? I mean, look, given, so I mean, I can give you a theoretical answer, I can give you a practical political answer. I mean, right now, I just don't think that you will be able to get very far by saying that we like to nationalize all the data of Google and Facebook. In fact, because you just don't have it. It's not stored in your country. You'll have to go and conquer California to nationalize it. <laughs> that you can start uh, figuring out a different legal regime, which will, uh, which of course will be a mess at the level of world trade. But you can still, nonetheless, figuring out how you can make sure that, uh, as the very first step, these companies store all the data locally, in which case you don't need to conquer California anymore, in the case you do decide to nationalize it. But then you also figure out how you can incentivize citizens uh, to uh, share the data that they generate, not just with the firms who provide the services, but also with other entities like the city hall and the municipality and, and, and whoever, all the state, right? And because this space, it's very important to understand that, these firms tap into the discourse of morality even. You know, they all talk about things like data philanthropy. As if you know, all of us are data philanthropists that have to give our data to Google because Google is fighting, is helping to fight cancer. You know, if you don't give data to Google, you are preventing uh, the world from getting a solution to cancer. And that's the rhetoric that uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin occasionally use on stage. Right? And I think fine, but we can say that there are different ways to be a data philanthropist, and one of them is to be sharing that data with other non-commercial institutions. But in the absence of specific, very well-built services and platforms that have to be built by people who do not work for Facebook or do not end up working for Facebook, definitely remain at the level of rhetoric. You know, this is why having concrete, specific prototypes in cities uh, is, is, is a way to go. But again, you need somebody to commit a pool of money, have a strategy, and uh, keep some people on the payroll who can at least design those interfaces through which you can donate the data to somebody and gather data first of all, but then also donate the data to somebody other than Google and Amazon. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, practically, that's the way in which I would move. But then, if you manage to have a national strategy for it, and there is a very strategic and clever way, then you can accelerate many of those processes, again, through law, um, but then also by inserting certain provisions into tenders, which will make it prohibitively expensive for Amazon and others to bid on services which can be offered by domestic players uh, much more effectively. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, very interesting. Now you just entered part of the question I had. Uh, so I'll just turn to the example I was going to use. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, in this country, there's a very good sort of historical example tending, pointing towards something that might be, yes. uh, might serve as an example for, for, for this. Uh, you mentioned that big data, well, yes. the parallel has been made quite often, the new oil, okay. big yes. data, new oil. Yes. Actually, when it comes to oil exploration yes. in this country, the legal framework mm -hmm. obliges big oil companies, all of them, to share their data, geological data, yes. with the public, yes. with the ministry. So basically, that's been a way to cap their their future power yes. over our continental shores. Sure. sure, sure, sure. So is, is, is that legal framework something that could be served as an example for this? So uh, again, theoretically, yes, practically, no, in part because <laughs> Oil companies need Norway. Uh, data companies don't need Norway. It's a very simple answer. And this is where you just have nothing. You have no bargaining power over them. Your market is too small. China has bargaining power. European Union will have bargaining power if you manage to negotiate as a block. Uh, there is very little that would keep any of those companies in Norway. Like there is not, there is, I mean, you, you, you are a very good market, very good country, very rich people, but you're too small. So they can afford to lose you. 
Uh, and unfortunately, that makes comparisons to oil very hard to pull off. You know, there are, you have many examples in this country. You know, I even studied the example with the development of hydroelectric power 100 years ago, when you were developing you know, the energy from the you know, waterfalls and whatnot. And when you actually managed to set up a system where you invited foreign companies to develop all those resources, but you set in a limit. So, you know, they had to, they could operate that for 10, 15 years, and then they had to revert back the ownership to the public sector. And you can think about equal systems for the digital economy. The problem is that there are very few incentives for the digital companies to actually to comply with what you want them to do, right? Because in this sense, data is not like oil, because it's very fungible and it's very abundant. Uh, and unfortunately, you can do it if you negotiate as a block. Uh, so you know, India can set a lot of conditions on uh, Amazon, and they do. So you know, there is a reason why the only countries that succeeded in pushing big technology companies towards the requirement of local data storage. So you know, uh, they basically have to keep data on the servers in those countries are Russia, China, and India. You know, there is a reason why they have succeeded because they're just huge giant markets and you cannot afford not to be there. Uh, once you move beyond that, it just becomes very hard. So then you really have to understand how to do it at the European level where the dissonance between member states just makes it very hard to have a coherent strategy. And also their uh, difference in their kind of attitudes towards the US also makes it very hard because you'll never get Poland on the same page as, uh, I don't know, Germany on this issue, where the industry has a very different agenda sometimes. Was somebody else, I think? Yeah. No? So maybe we should take a few so that, because I think we're yeah, running out of time, so I'll just take a few questions, yes. Yeah. The, uh, from Bob, Bob, uh, yeah, when, uh, when you're talking about solution with uh, public data, isn't there uh, somewhat of a, a contradiction when it comes to geopolitical interests of nations? Uh -huh. uh, okay, you, you uh, one one thing is uh, like developing uh, AI and stuff like that, which is obviously in the interest of uh, the big geopolitical players, but also just uh, gathering uh, data on their own and also other people's, uh, other other countries' inhabitants. Yes. It's it's, uh, it's it's when it comes to the uh, intelligence community, that's mm -hmm. that's what they do, uh, and and. I think uh, probably the biggest or the most important uh, single finding of the Edward Snowden leaks is yes. basically that uh, American intelligence uh, services know what Facebook, Google, Yahoo, yes. etc. knows about me. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, well, it's I I'm just saying that the, it's it's not very um, realistic that they would just give that up, especially when when because you're talking about. Uh, sure. uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the the geopolitical uh, context of uh, sure, sure, but I don't think they are going to give that up. I mean, I think my point was actually the opposite that they, you know, most mm -hmm. the Americans and the Chinese are not going to give that up because partly there are also state interests. There is a kind of a marriage between the state interests and the business interests yeah. uh, in, in in both cases, and uh, in the in the Chinese case, it's even more pro kind of pronounced because clearly you have an expansion of the Chinese economy, not so much in the tech sector, but in the construction sector and financial sector and insurance sector, and now it's also increasingly in the tech sector, linked very clearly to the government's enabling strategy. Uh, but no, no, I don't see by any way, uh, by any means, uh, any dis disharmony. Uh, but when it comes to, to like making the data uh, more of a public uh, domain and, and oh, sure no I don't expect the Chinese or the Americans to do it forget about it yeah. no they're not going to do it so I mean in China you don't need to do it because it kind of uh, the current model nobody's interested in building a fully democratic society of people with full rights in China you know it's not on the agenda uh, you know they're interested in other things and bridging inequality and other things you know it, well, I'm not I'm not bashing China I mean but their current model for the kind of political society they're building, it works. You don't want any other model. You know, you'll, you'll put social credit system and other innovations on top of it, but they, there, is, there is no problem they need to be solving when it comes to democratizing access to data. I mean, they already have the most advanced AI imaginable. Uh, and, uh, but in America, also, I just don't think that it will be on the agenda anytime soon. 
And you know, if you look at the political debate in the US, it's, uh, there is no disagreement whatsoever between somebody like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren and people on the kind of right-wing uh, Trumpian side when it comes to their hatred of Chinese tech companies. You know, some people hate that the right-wingers and the Republicans hate them because they present a threat to American national security interests. And the Bernie Sanders and Warren hate them because they present a threat to American workers because this, uh, uh, they threat to put Amazon and Microsoft out of job, <laughs> out, of, out, of, out of the market. So there is a very coherent <coughs> response there. In Europe, we can debate to what extent uh, you might, in, I mean, clearly, I don't expect the German security services to be behind the agenda of public, or sort of public data accessible to, but you know, it's, it's, I think it's more of a battlefield than it is in, the, in China or the US, in part because you can get industry on your side, I think, uh, at least parts of that industry uh, on your side. Sorry, I, I promised to take more questions mm -hmm. before answering, but so it's not good enough. Yeah, about Obama. Yeah, yes, it was partly answered, but uh, the re relationship to the military industry. Yes. Can you say something about that? Because, mm -hmm. for example, when Norway buy fighter planes, we don't buy it from China, we buy it from the USA. Can something yes. similar be happening when it comes to the... Well, you don't even buy it from France, as far as I know. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, not, it's not just China, it's just that there are certain, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait until that, yeah. Mm. Did, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. um, yeah um, I'm thinking about like a, a, a conflict of objectives, because uh -huh. uh, how would you tackle like the arguments when it comes to like the green shift, that uh -huh. these solutions are needed now, and also yes. um, arguments that you shouldn't just, um, when you, uh, Evaluate like how polluting something is. Like you take the entire production line into account, and mm -hmm. uh, the argument would be that it's wasteful to just uh, start a lot of unnecessary industries when you already have the solutions that you can combine them. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, and the argument that we need these solutions today instead of sure. Yeah. No, no. I mean, are there others? Should I answer? Are there other questions? I don't know. I don't know if I'm there. No, I don't know. Um, so let's let's start with the military. Um, you know, I think increasingly um, here the situation is not clear because on the one hand, um, if you look at Europe, so you have now two competing, uh, almost schizophrenic kind of messages that come from the political elites, including the military elites. On the one hand, there is clearly a suspicion of doing more with China. When, especially when it comes to 5G. You know, the question of 5G and switching to this new generation uh, mobile networks, everybody realizes that perhaps the Chinese networks have as many backdoors as the American ones. Because we already know the Americans ones have backdoors. That was the whole point of Edward Snowden revelation. So nobody suspects American systems of being completely clean. Uh, but since there is a geopolitical relationship with America, there is somehow an assumption that it hurts us less than uh, the back doors from China. So there is, on the one hand, suspicion towards the Chinese technologies. On the other hand, there is a realization that the America is no longer the ally that it once was. And I think it never was that ally, but for the political dominant classes, it was a reliable ally. And with Trump, which has America first slogan, it's no longer a reliable ally, which means that it's also plausible that all this uh, loud noise around 5G and China is deliberately stirred up by Washington in order to delay the rollout of 5G in Europe and thus make Europe less competitive because the only players that can essentially accelerate the deployment of 5G in Europe now are the Chinese companies. So uh, there is there's also a counter strategy inside the military and inside the national security apparatus in Europe, which basically tells you that unless we do business with China now, we will be behind economically, strategically, security-wise, uh, and so forth. And I think that applies to, uh, to a lot of issues when it comes to technology, not just to 5G, in part because on many of them, Europe has lost the capacity to provide and furnish many of the components domestically, or we never had it, like, you know, on the airplanes and you know, many other things. 
So uh, I think much here is shaped by the elite perception of just how reliable the transatlantic alliance, quote unquote, is. And if it's no longer seen as something reliable or something where you can actually trust Washington at all, then I think you have even much more of a pushback towards either diversifying the bids, so to say, so maybe it will not just be China, maybe it will also be, I don't know, India or Brazil or whoever has the capacity to deliver those resources. But I, I would not expect uh, the same permanent bowing down to the interests of Washington as has been in the last 20 or 30 years. In part because there are just no signs inside the Trump administration that they're receptive to the interests of the other side, where they have the power to grab the blanket on themselves. Like, I just don't see it. Like, and I think it's becoming very hard to defend among the pro-transatlantic decision makers in Europe, that kind of attitude. But you know, beyond that, I just, you know, I, I, I spent not enough time inside the military circles to, to answer it in, in, in any more depth. On the question of the uh, sort of to what extent there is urgency in these issues now, given the problems we have with regards to the environment and the, the, the necessity and the urgency of the transition, um, I think here you know, it's up for debate. Uh, to some extent, the, the rhetoric coming from these firms is uh, dubious and duplicitous because th what they say is that they do allow us to do things much more efficiently and much greater. You know, so Google, if you listen to them, they will tell you that their ability to deploy artificial intelligence uh, in their own servers and in their own kind of infrastructure has allowed them to cut their energy bills by 40%. And this is now a service which they're now trying to pitch to everybody else because they've managed to use AI to cut down their own energy costs, so now they turn it into a service that other enterprises can tap into. And Uber will give you the same story, that they just basically have superb big data algorithms and AI, which allow them to deploy, uh, you know, they, they used to speak about the perpetual right, which was their description of a car that was always in circulation. And it basically uh, allows you to use the same resources much more efficiently without having to engage in our production or have overcapacity of any kind. So the ability to deploy real-time feedback loops allows you to take advantage of existing resources without having to build new ones. You know, Airbnb will give you the same story about uh, the ability to use existing uh, houses instead of building new hotels. So uh, I think not all of that is false. And that to me it's obvious that if you have the ability to tag every single object with a sensor, if you have the ability to then control uh, resource use, if you have the ability then to monitor resource use and uh, to adjust uh, all of these networks in real time, you will achieve uh, better use of resources. To what extent the costs of doing that are higher than the benefits, it's an empirical question, right? And it's true, of course, that uh, none of this comes for free. You know, you have you, know, you need tons of minerals, you need cobalt, you need. Uh, many other ingredients that go into many of these devices. You are burning a lot of energy to run the data centers. Uh, there is tons of electronic waste that occurs. I mean, I'm not denying any of that, but that's something we have to settle empirically, I think, because it's also, I just don't want to deny that there are real benefits to using digital networks and sensors and uh, devices in order to optimize our current resource use. It also seems to me an obvious point to make. So uh, how do you balance those two? I don't think that we can do it morally or philosophically and kind of thinking that just because capitalism has shaped the development of these technologies in a particular way over the last 100 years or 20 years, then technology in this case is not an ally to an alternative project. But you know, on this issue, I know that we can debate it all day. I mean, I've had those discussions in many places with people who have a much more philosophical reading of technology than me. I have a very pragmatic, materialistic, you know, Marxist reading of technology. For me, technology can be repurposed to a very different end with a very different political project. For many people who are much more of the ecological bent, it's evil to be feared and to kind of reject it. And on this, I don't know how we're going to settle this, but I'm more than happy to hear what I, you're going to say. I think you misunderstood my question. Uh, Possibly. Uh, it's, it's, it's just that, um, um, the argument is often that it's urgent to implement these things now. Yes. 
in essence talking about establishing an industry. So establishing yes. your own industry takes time. So it's like sure. the argument for, uh, and we see that in like Norwegian uh, municipal policies and national policies that instead of like uh, making your own product, they yes. buy from other areas and then yes. they use those uh, environmentalist arguments or uh, uh, or they might get backlash from environmentalists that, oh, but this is wasteful and building your own energy. Yeah, um, industry and stuff like that. So, so sure, okay, now I think I get it better. No, no, so you know, in, in my case, yeah, yeah, so in my case, you know, as, as I've been, uh, maybe I, I should make this point sharper next time I, I, I give this talk. No, I just don't think that you can get it as a service, you know, so like that, that will be the way to frame it. So you can get, you know, AI as a service, cloud computing as a service, mobility as a service, anything that is offered as a service, which means that it's provided from the cloud by somebody else and you are just on the receiving end and uh, you don't need to worry about anything, it will just come from somewhere. So to some extent, you know, it's an argument made about trade. Right? It's almost the same argument. You know, just let whoever can do it more efficiently do it, and then you'll just reap the benefits of it. I just don't believe in that, in part because, because of the extra geopolitical considerations I have outlined, because of extra uncertainties that arise from capitalist competition within these firms, and the extra imperatives that their embeddedness in financial market imposes on them, I just do not think that this is a clever strategy for the public sector because you cannot be sure of anything. You know, you strike a deal with Amazon and Amazon discovers that it can make much more money in, I don't know, Denmark and you no longer have Amazon Cloud serving your uh, education school or whatever, uh, healthcare system. Uh, you think that you no longer need to invest into production of digital networks through which people can, I don't know, consume academic content. And like, that to me is still a mystery. Why on earth a country like Norway cannot build a decent, well-functioning alternative to Google Scholar? Like I really do not understand why the entire academic world of the world has to rely on a service which Google can shut down tomorrow. Like there is zero money that Google makes for Google Scholar. That it, to me it's not obvious why countries and entities that have had the money to develop it, it wouldn't take a lot of money to do it, have assumed that this public goods can essentially be delivered by private companies pursuing their own agendas. And to me, this assumption is just wrong because we have seen that Google has absolutely no problem turning off the services once they understood that you know Google Plus is shutting down tomorrow, March 5th, that's when Google Plus goes down. Like if you have built anything on Google Plus, thinking that will be the social network of the future, boom, it's not there. Right? And to me, the idea that you can somehow cleverly exploit this in the long term and you will be on the winning side as somebody working for the public sector or for the government, I just don't believe that. You know, ultimately, because nobody can, nobody has any clue, including these firms how all of this dynamics of inter-industry competition, the embeddedness of financial markets, and the geopolitical environment, what it's gonna mean for Huawei, Alibaba, Apple, Facebook, Google, and everybody. nobody has a clue where these firms will be one year, five years, or 10 years from now. So building your healthcare system, or education system, or transportation system on them, it's like playing with Russian roulette, you know? You might be lucky, but you might also not be lucky. And Chances are you will not be lucky most of the time. And that to me is an argument for developing an alternative infrastructure for doing all of these things. Good? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Good, excellent. I will enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to my, yeah. I would love to stay, but my wife is with me and yeah, I have yeah. to <laughs>